In this video, I'll show you the essential board bring up steps for an STM32 WB based custom hardware design. In this case, this is an STM32 WB55 microcontroller with most of its pins broken out to breadboard friendly headers, as well as a chip antenna, a user switch, which also doubles as a boot zero switch, a USB C connector, which takes care of a data connection to a host, as well as power. The pads you're seeing with these non plated through holes is part of a Tag Connect header, which is our programming interface. So a very, very simple board, but there are some quirks when setting up the firmware, but I'll guide you through all the basic steps and show you how we can get a basic Bluetooth example up and running. We'll only be looking at firmware in this video, but if you're interested in the hardware design, I actually have a full five hour tutorial split up in two videos that goes over a KiCad 7 and an SM32 Bluetooth hardware design, very similar to the board you're seeing in this video and will be using in this video. The first video is number 127 on my channel, and that goes over the schematic. And the second video is video number 128, which goes over the PCP design and ordering process. I'll leave links to these in the description below. A huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. I had these Blue Fill SN32WB custom hardware designs manufactured and assembled by PCBWay in China. They did a great job with this design with absolutely no flaws and I can highly recommend their services. But make sure also to follow them on Instagram to check out all the cool new designs they are manufacturing and assembling. Although I do have a full tutorial in KiCad 7, I did design the board you're seeing in this video and will be using for the firmware bring up using Altium Designer. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial as well as 25% off your first license purchase. With a free trial, you can check out Altium 365, which contains many, many cool features I use in my day-to-day -day job, such as library management, mechanical co-design, supply chain management, and so on. To help you out with sourcing components, rather than going to individual distributors, also make sure to check out Octopart, which is a global component search engine, which scans across many different distributors and is a very, very useful tool. Before we go over to the firmware, let's just briefly familiarize ourselves with the schematic and the hardware so we know what we're testing. This is a single page schematic. It's very, very simple, effectively just a breakout board for the SM32 WB55 CEU6 microcontroller, which is the centerpiece here. On the left hand side, we start with a USB type C connector, which is for data and the main way of powering this board. So there's some ESD protection, but effectively the differential pair feeds directly into the SM32 microcontroller. The power, which is normally at five volts, is fed into a five volt to 3.3 volt buck converter. So 3.3 volt is effectively our IO voltage of the system. In terms of programming interfaces, we're using serial wire debug and I'm using a Tag Connect serial wire debug header. Additionally, we also have the boot zero connection, which is by default pulled down. Boot zero pulled low means we effectively run the firmware on startup in the microcontroller. But if we pull boot zero high to 3.3 volts in this case, when we power cycle the board, the SM32WB will jump to its effectively built in bootloader. So we can, for example, flash code via UART or USB and so on. So that's why we have this user switch here. And also after boot, we can then use the user switch for a different function if we want to. On the right hand side, we have a single 32 megahertz crystal oscillator, which is the high speed external crystal, which we'll see later. But we don't have an LSE, a low speed external crystal, which will be important with the firmware later on as well. There's a few quirks we have to be aware of. Other than that, we have the integrated switch mode power supply, which is particular to the SM32WB line of microcontrollers, and of course the RF front end, which contains a matching network hooked up to the RF1 pin, a low pass filter, and then we connect to the chip antenna, which is on this PCB. So very, very straightforward design. We want to test USB, the serial wire debug connection, the boot zero interface, of course power, and of course our Bluetooth connection via our chip antenna. The specific microcontroller we will be writing some firmware for or configuring it is the SM32WB55CE. This is a dual core processor, which will be important later when we're loading in, for example, the Bluetooth, the BLE stacks and so on. It has native USB, various other peripherals, and of course, Bluetooth as well. We need to know the part number, of course, because we need this to set up our tools as well. If you'd like to follow along, I'd strongly suggest downloading SM32 Cube IDE, which is a free integrated development environment, which I predominantly use when I'm developing with SM32 microcontrollers. This helps us with setting up peripherals, pinouts, and of course, programming the device. What is also very useful is this SM32 Cube Programmer. SM32 Cube IDE and Cube Programmer are free tools. So I'd strongly suggest downloading this because we can use this to flash firmware and we'll need to use this to also flash, for example, the wireless stacks. 
When it comes to actually programming the device, of course you could do this via USB, via DFU, device firmware upgrade, but that's quite tedious. So I'd suggest investing into a debugger, and this is only about 10 or 20 euros or dollars. And the latest debugger from ST is this ST-Link V3. And this is the device I'll be using. And this plugs on one end into your host computer via USB and on the other end via a serial wire debug or JTAG connection to your custom hardware. Remembering back to the Bluefield board we'll be using in this video, I've exposed the serial wire debug pins to what's known as a tag connect header on the left hand side. So rather than a physical component that needs to be mounted on a program interface, these are simply exposed pads and some non-plated through holes. And this is where then this ST-Link debugger will be connected to but also using an interface cable, which in this case happens to be the TC2030, which is a six pin pogo pin connector that plugs in to these pads we saw on the blue film. So that combination, the TC2030 with the ST-Link is what in my case I'll be using, but of course it depends on what hardware design you created. Now let me show you how I hook this up. So we're gonna power this board using the USB-C connection, and that'll also be used for data later on, as well as this tag connect header, which is our serial wire debug interface. So here's the ST-Link V3, an adapter cable, which then goes to the Tag Connect header that simply clips in on its own. And then of course we add in the USB Type-C cable for power and data. The first thing I'd like to show you is how you can use, for example, STM32Q Programmer. So one of the two programs I showed you the web address for, and again, links in the description below, how we can use this program to check connectivity to our device. So as you just saw, I plugged in a USB cable, which provides power, as well as my Tag Connect header to the ST-Link V3. On the right-hand side, with STM32Q Programmer open, you can see we have various options of how we connect to our target device, our microcontroller in this case, either via the ST-Link, via UART or USB. However, if I click on USB, we can see there's no DFU device detected, because by default, just plugging in power and having boot zero port low, which was our user switch in this case. If I don't press the user switch, then the microcontroller actually doesn't boot into your DFU mode. Therefore, we need to use the ST-Link. We can use these default settings and simply click connect, and it automatically reads out what device memory might be on there. The device memory that's in flash, on the bottom right, we can see the target information, what type of microcontroller is, flash sizes, and so on. And this tool is very, very useful because we can, for example, upload different firmware. We can change on the left-hand side what's known as option bytes. We can look at CPU status and registers and so on. And this is the tool we'll be using to start off with. If you'd like to program via USB, and this is not something I'd recommend because debuggers are so much more useful, it's far quicker and so on. Let me show you how to do that now. Before we can program via USB, and this seems to be a quirk of this device, I actually had to open Q Programmer and connect via an ST-Link and then go to the Option Bytes menu, go to the User Configuration tab, and then if you see this flag, this Option Byte, End Switch Boot Zero, for me, by default, that was unchecked. And unchecked means it's taken from the Option Bit, but not from the Boot Zero pin. So I actually had to connect to the device via the ST-Link, select this Option Byte, and then on the right side, press Apply. And this now means we can use the boot zero pin to toggle our device into DFU mode. And what I will now do is I'll remove power. So I'll take away my USB connection. Then I'll press down on this boot switch, which connects to the boot zero pin of the microcontroller. While I'm holding it down, I will plug in the USB type C cable again. I'll do this with the device manager open. So I'm unplugging my USB C cable. I'm holding the boot zero switch. Now I'm plugging in my power and there we go. What do you see now? is this new device has appeared, DFU in FS mode. So device firm upgrade in full speed mode. This is the default bootloader in the SM32 microcontroller that has now started up because we've pulled boot zero high at startup using this boot zero switch. So if I go back to Cube Programmer, I can of course connect via the ST-Link, but we can now change to USB, click this little refresh icon, and you can see it's now detected USB one, which is in fact our microcontroller. So I can connect to that, and I can read out the memory, I can program memory, and so on. So this is how you would, for example, then flash or connect via USB if you want to use the internal bootloader. Just as a demonstration, and again, I did have to change in the Option Bytes menu the user configuration end switch boot zero to be checked. Maybe that was just a quirk in my particular case. In any case, what we can do now, I'll just disconnect, and I'll actually connect via ST-Link, which is our preferred method. So I'll disconnect using ST-Link again. And what we now need to do in SM32 Cube Program is a few different things. The SM32 WB microcontroller, as we saw, is a dual core device. What we'll be interfacing and programming with predominantly is one of the cores, but the other core handles, for example, the wireless front end. That needs to be programmed separately using Cube Programmer. 
I'll leave a link to this in the description box below as usual. But what we need to do is download these coprocessor binaries, so binaries or firmware for one of the two processors that, for example, runs a Bluetooth stack, and there's many different versions. If you want to have a full one or a light one, there's Zigbee stacks and so on, depending on your, spe on your specific use case. What we'll be flashing is just a simple Bluetooth BLE stack, and where you can get them from is a GitHub link, and this is actually also on this webpage. If we go to the Copro wireless binaries in the middle, that goes to a GitHub link, and here we can find all of these stacks depending on what which one you need so zigbee thread full or live ble stacks and so on now which stack you need of course depends on the application for this video we will be downloading the ble stack full but we also need another binary which is this fus which is a firmware upgrade service file the reason we need this firmware update service is because if we go back to Cube Programmer on the left hand side, go to this Wi Fi looking symbol, we can see we have various different options. And this is the firmware upgrade service. So the firmware upgrade service itself is used to flash, for example, a different stack. So what we have to do, we can first of all start the FUS, this firmware update service, in the middle right button, this start FUS. If I click on that, this might take just a tiny bit of time. We can see that it started this firmware update service. And then we can go to the top right and read FUS infos. And here we can see that we have a certain FUS version. In this case, it's 1.2 stack version and so on. This happens to be a fairly modern, so to speak, version because I did already upgrade the firmware on this. But typically, these SM32WB ship with a pretty outdated FUS version. That's why you would download this FUS underscore firmware dot binary, go to Cube Programmer, and then we need to choose the FUS. So I downloaded it here. I would open FUS underscore firmware dot bin. But before we can actually do the firmware upgrade, we need to change the start address. To actually find the address where we need to place this FUS, and then later on where we need to place the stack we choose, we can open this release notes.html, and I happen to have downloaded that. If we scroll down a tiny bit, we can see the firmware upgrade service binary table. We have WB5X and the FUS underscore firmware bin. And for our particular device, depending on what character it ends with, we need to place it at a different address. We happen to be using in this video an SM32WB55CE U6, which is the 512K flash version. So therefore, I'll just copy this address, go to Cube Programmer, paste that in, and then click firmware upgrade. This again might take a tiny bit of time. Then we have a firmware delete success and a firmware upgrade success. So this is what you should hopefully see if you choose the correct FUS binary as well as the correct start address. Now we can press start FUS again and then click read FUS infos just to make sure we have the correct version. And there we go. We have the FUS version 1.2 and now you can see the stack version is actually gone because it's removed the stack I had previously installed. Now we're going to do a similar process to now add in the Bluetooth low energy stack. I'll go to browse again. I'll select the stack I downloaded, which is the full BLE stack. And now we have to change the start address once again. So going back to this HTML file, I went with BLE stack full. And this again, the start address depends on what flash size, so what part number you choose. Again, we're using WB55CE U6, and therefore I need this address. So I'll copy that, go back to programmer, paste that in, and then do firmware upgrade. Then we have firmware delete success, and then it'll write the BLE stack. And there we go, firmware upgrade success. Now we've written both the FUS and afterwards we can then place the BLE stack as we just did. I'll just start the FUS again and then we can read the FUS infos as before and see if the stack version has now changed. So read FUS infos and there we go. Now we have a different number for our BLE stack, which is hopefully the version we downloaded. And that's pretty much all we need to do. Now we can move over to Cube IDE and actually get properly started with the firmware. But this is something you always have to do at least once, depending on what stack you want to use, is flash that to the coprocessor, because now we'll be interfacing with the main processor. Now with the FUS installed, and we use the FUS then to flash the BLE stack on the coprocessor, we can now target the main firmware. There are some quirks, which I'd like to show you in this video, also depending on how you've designed your hardware. So if you open up stm 32 IDE, go to the top left, File, New, and then stm 32 Project, we can type in the cart number, and that's an stm 32 wb 55 ceu 6 That's the part we'll choose. Bottom right, click Next. We'll give it a name. I'll just call this Blue Fill Demo, and we can click Finish. Of course, you can change the language to whatever one you want. Once the project has been set up, you'll be greeted with this IOC window, which lets us select pinouts and peripherals and so forth. 
Right now, on the right hand side, you can just see the bear SM32 WB55. We could either click on individual pins and then select their function and so on. What I'd like to show you very basically in this video is simply an application that can, for example, connect to my phone, receive messages, and it'll print those messages out via USB. So we won't be actually enabling many peripherals. I just want to show you how to set up USB and the Bluetooth interface. The first thing I always do is enable serial wire debug. So at the top left, go to system core, sys, debug, and select trace asynchronous serial wire. If I select that, you can see I get three pins. One is the clock interface, the data input output, as well as a trace. Now, you only really need clock and DIO, so you could also just select serial wire, but I quite like having the trace in because that gives additional debug functionality. It depends on what hardware design you have, of course. With our serial wire debug in place, what we need to do next is, for example, enable the crystal oscillators, the external ones. To do that, we go to the top left, go to RCC under system core, HSC is the high speed external, so crystal surround resonator. And if you want to run a wireless stack, then you do need to enable and have an external crystal oscillator on the HSC. Now the LSE is optional to a certain extent, depending on what power modes you want to go into. And I would suggest adding that to your board as well. So an LSE, which is a 32.768 kilohertz crystal oscillator external as well. And you can enable it like so, and that appears on pins PC14, PC15. Now actually for this board that I designed, I didn't add in an LSE because it didn't require it, but it does mean that you can't enter, for example, very low power sleep modes for BLE. And there's some additional config required if you don't have that LSE crystal. So if you have the space, if you don't have any particular reason not to add it in, I would suggest adding it in for the sake of simplicity. But I'll leave a link in the description below that walks you through configuring this SM32WB for Bluetooth LE without an LSE crystal. And that's a fairly comprehensive guide, pretty step by step. There are some quirks depending on which Cube IDE version you use. That's all documented in this link, which I'll leave in the description box below. In your case, if you have an LSE, please do leave this enabled. For me, I actually don't have one, so I'll disable this. And later, off camera, so to speak, I'll add in all of the settings based on this blog post. Other than our serial wire debug connection and the crystal oscillators, what I would like to enable is USB. Because for the application we'll be seeing later, what we'll have is a Bluetooth interface, which we can connect to, for example, via our phone to our custom hardware, that we can then send messages from the phone to the hardware and they'll print them out via USB, just as a very, very basic example. So on the bottom left, under connectivity, click on USB, check device FS, which is full speed, and we can see this USB differential pair appear on the top right. Nicely enough, if we go to the bottom left, middleware and software packs, we can see this entry USB device. ST actually bundles quite a few pre-made drivers depending on your application's needs. If I go to this dropdown, we have, for example, an audio device class, we have an HID class and so on. What we'll be using is this virtual COM port, which is a CDC or communication device class. So if I enable that, that'll load the drivers when we create the code for this project. So make sure to enable that. Again, depends on your use case. With our crystals enabled, again, keep in mind, if you have an LSE, enable the LSE or follow that blog post I'll leave in the description box below. What we want to do now is enable the RF section and add in our Bluetooth functionality. And this is quite a bit more involved. There's quite a lot of things to it. It depends on the application. It depends on what services you want and so on. So there is quite a bit to this. I'll show you a very, very basic example. But keep in mind, this whole Bluetooth and BLE universe is quite large. So there's quite a lot to this. As some further reading, I'd strongly suggest looking at, for example, the Adafruit blog about GATS, which is the generic attributes, which we'll be using in this video. And that goes through, for example, the topology of our Bluetooth network, what transactions there are, servers and clients, differences between profiles, services, characteristics, and so on. And these are keywords, so to speak, we'll see when we're configuring our BLE interface. So make sure to read that. If you'd like to go a bit deeper as well, ST themselves actually has a getting started series for the STM32WB line. And you can see there's many, many different examples of how to set this up depending on your application's needs. And I'll leave a link to this playlist in the description box below as usual. In our case, what we need to do is ultimately enable in the middleware and software pack section on the left-hand side, this STM32WPAN entry. However, if you hover over WPAN, we can see it's not available currently. And this is because we can see BLE mode is active only if RF, RTC, RCC, IPCC, and HSEM are enabled. So we have to enable all of these sections to make sure we get access to this middleware, which then lets us set up the BLE stack. 
So what we have to do is, for example, go to this top, go to HSEM, which is short for hardware semaphores, which enables synchronization between the two cores of this device. If we activate that, make sure then we need the IPCC, which is one below and under system core, which is the interference communication controller. Remember, we have two cores in this device. One is running the Bluetooth, the BLE stack, and one is effectively running our application code. And these somehow need to communicate with each other. And they actually do that with some shared bits of RAM. We need to enable this IPCC, click activate. And we also have to enable the interrupt controller for these, both for the RX and TX. So if we select those, then we also have to enable the RTC, which is under the timer section on the left-hand side. So RTC, click activate clock source. We want to select the wake up to be in an internal wake up. And then also in the interrupt controller, we want to enable the interrupt. Now this is only required for certain examples, but as we saw, if we go on the left-hand side, scroll down, this WPAN requires the RTC to be enabled so that we even get access to this. We're almost done. What we also have to do is of course enable the RF interface, which is this RF1 pin on the bottom of the microcontroller, which interfaces with the antenna. So on the left-hand side, go to connectivity, RF, activate RF1. Now, with any luck, if we scroll to the bottom left again, we can see this STM32 service is now enabled. So we can click on that in the middleware section and then choose the relevant stack you're using in your design. For us in this demo, this will be BLE. So we can click on that and that enables the BLE stack, so to speak. Now there's many, many different parameters and options you can enable here. You can add in all of your services, IDs and whatnot. There are many, many different options you, have, you can configure. Of course, far too many for this single video. Again, please refer to some online tutorials, some blog posts and so on, which I'll be leaving in the links in the description below. What we'll actually be setting up is an interface between, for example, my phone in this case, and this custom bit of hardware that I can send, for example, some bits of data from my phone via Bluetooth to the custom bits of hardware and then print that out via USB. To do that, ST has a pretty nifty STBLE toolbox, which is available for phones on Android and iOS. I'm running Android, so I've already downloaded that to my phone, and we'll see later how we can use that to check, for example, the received signal strength, as well as to transmit or receive data. So we'll create a very, very basic interface. We're not creating any custom application for the phone and so on, just to give you an idea of how to set this up. There's, of course, far, far more detail to all of this. We're back to Cube IDE in the BLE configuration. Let's set up our applications and services. In the BLE applications and services section, we want to go to custom P2P server and we'll just disable that for now. And instead we'll enable custom template, which is one below. And you can see now we've got some additional tabs which have appeared in this configuration section. We have BLE pairing, we have BLE GAT, which is, I refer you back to this Adafruit blog, BLE advertising and so on. Under BLE advertising, that tab, if we look at the advertising elements, we can see we include AD type complete local name, and I'd like to change that to yes. If I change that to yes, this will actually be the identifier that, for example, we'll see in the toolbox on your phone what your Bluetooth device is listed as. So the default name is this XXSTM32, I'll just type in blue fill, and that'll be what appears when we do, for example, a pair request and so on. Next, we'll set up a GAT. Again, please refer to this Adafruit blog. What we'll do is create a service and a characteristic. A service is effectively a collection of characteristics, and the characteristic itself is, as we see here, the lowest level concept in GAT transactions, which contains, for example, data points or a method of transferring data, so to speak. So it could be a variable that we can transfer from or to a device, very, very simply speaking. So in Cube IDE, the way we do that is go to the tab BLE GAT, and we'll just create one service for now. And we have to enter a long name and a short name of the service. So I can just type in, for example, BP service, so Bluefill service. The name isn't particularly important in this scenario. I'll give it the same long and short name. Once you've created that service, you can see another tab has appeared, which is named after whatever you gave it as the service name, which is in our case, Bluefill or BP service. If I click on that, there is some additional information we have to enter here. This is some information on the service itself, as well as any characteristics that are associated with that service. So I can change the number of characteristics here. So very, very simply speaking, how many data containers, but for now we'll just go with one. Now in our case, all we're gonna do is use the phone to write, for example, a character, transmit that to our hardware, and then print that out via USB. So all we're gonna do is have, for example, a character write characteristic, and I'll use the same long and short name. Then other than the name, we can adjust other properties of this characteristic. If we scroll down, we can change the type of characteristic this is. So if it's a read or write or anything else, and we'll go with a write characteristic. 
Then scrolling even further down, we can see there are events that can be generated depending on what's happening, very simply speaking. And we only want that events to happen when we have a write or change the other two to no and just leave attribute write as yes. And that's pretty much all we have to do for this very, very simple example is how to set up this BLE stack. What we do also have to do is set up the clocks. As you can see in the clock configuration tab at the top, we have this little X because we have some problems with our clocking. So I'll just close this little window for now. And this is the whole clocking structure with various PLLs, input sources, and where these then go to. Of course, if you have LSE enabled, you'll see the LSE. But for us, we also have the HSC enabled, which is the high speed external crystal. And that should normally be at 32 megahertz, which will be our input frequency. We can see cube ID has already correctly selected the PLL clock to feed from the HSE to give us 32 megahertz as a core, but you can see the USB is wrong. So you can either modify these parameters ourselves or simply click on resolve clock issues and cube ID will automatically sort this out in most cases. Sometimes it needs a tiny bit of help. But with that being said, this is pretty much all we need to do for now. We set up our BLE GAT, we set up USB, our crystals and serial wire debug and everything that's required for this BLE stack for now. So we click on save or control S. This will now generate the code for us. After we save the IOC file, SM32 cube IDE generates all of the necessary drivers and supporting structure for our project. So feel free to scan through all of the different files it's created. For us at the moment, we're interested in main.c, which is in core source. Now, if we want to build this, we can click on the little hammer at the top left, which basically compiles this program. And then we can click the play button at the top to run the demo. We do need to edit the launch configurations if we want to. So we can set up, for example, different debuggers, other parameters and so on. But usually the default is OK. So if I click OK, it'll then upload the code via serial wire debug through the ST link to our hardware. You can see it's detected the device and now it's uploaded it. And now what we see bottom right, USB device not recognized even though we did set up USB as well as a communication device class driver. So in the device manager, we can see there's some unknown USB device, device script request failed. And this is some sort of bug that's part of these SM32WBs. And there's actually a forum or blog post on this where other people have had the same issues. And it's due to some clock being shut off when it shouldn't really be between the CPUs. So feel free to read this if you'd like more information on this. The fix is actually here as well. We need to copy this snippet and pop it in the peripheral clock config function. So back to cube IDE, we go back to main.c, look for peripheral common clock, and we just put this call right at the start, build, and now upload again by clicking the run icon. And now with any luck, we don't get any error message. If we go to the device manager, now we see USB serial device COM7 has appeared. We don't get any erroneous USB devices, and this is our communication device class which we can then use, for example, to stream data between our host computer and our MCU. So keep this in mind when working with these SM32WB devices, there are quite a few workarounds needed depending on your hardware, depending on what configurations you have. Now, with this running, we now have USB connectivity and we should already have, by default, effectively our Bluetooth service up and running. What I encourage you to do if you are following along is download this STBLE toolbox. Again, link in the description below. We'll see if we can find our hardware using this toolbox. What you're seeing now is my phone with the STBLE toolbox open. And here by default, we can see a list of Bluetooth devices which are in range, their IDs, as well as the received signal strength on the right hand side, these DVM values. So for example, minus 105 DVM is worse than minus 81 DVM. So the more positive or closer to zero we get, the better the received signal strength. We can sort by name, by manufacturer, or by signal strength itself. So I actually have my phone about 10 centimeters away from the hardware, which is running the firmware we just flashed via Cube IDE. So I'll sort by RSSI. And right at the top, we nicely see Bluefill, which is our device. We can see we have a RSSI of about minus 52 dBm, which is pretty good. Of course, we're very close to the device as well, so that does help. So what we can do is click on Bluefill, click Connect, and now we're connected to our microcontroller. So that's pretty cool. So in this, you can again see their RSSI. We can see, for example, the, the IDs and various services and attributes. And it turns out actually this last one here on the right hand side, if we click on that, this is the custom characteristic we actually set up. At the moment, it doesn't do very much. So if I click on write, I can write, for example, I don't know, a character, quick click send, which sends it by Bluetooth to our microcontroller. But of course, we're not doing anything much with it. So next, what I'd like to show you and how to implement as a very, very basic test is taking this character we're sending via Bluetooth 
and then transmitting that on the microcontroller side via USB CDC to a host by the USB connection. Back in STM32 Cube IDE, we've verified that we can get a Bluetooth connection. Our BLE stack seems to be up and running. What we want to do is now add in a tiny bit of functionality just to effectively complete this video. The way we can do that is go into our project on the left hand side, this STM32 WPAN folder, and go to custom underscore stm.c. You can see here we have some familiar names, so our blue fill service, our, our character write, which is the characteristics and services we set out previously in the IOC BLE config. If we scroll down around line 123, we can see we have a custom STM event handler function. And this gets called, in our case, when a characteristic is changed. And furthermore, scrolling down in the same function, we have an if statement, which effectively is fired, so to speak, and which we enter once our characteristic attribute is written to. So in this user code section, we will place our code that will take the data we receive and then place it simply on the USB bus. To do that, first of all, at the top in the include section, I'm going to paste in this include, which effectively pulls in the driver for the CDC class. On the left hand side, under USB device, USB CDCIF.h, we can see this header file includes a CDC transmit FS function, and this is the one we'll use to then send the data from our microcontroller to the host. So I'll copy that, go back to custom underscore stm.c, go back to the event handler, and in the if function in the user code section, I'll paste that in. Now we have to transmit a buffer and tell this function what length or how many characters we want to transmit. The way we can find that is by looking at the attribute modified variable. We go to that, we can see that struct actually contains the attribute data length as well as the attribute data. So that's what we want to transmit via USB. We're just simply taking it and pushing it over. So all I'm doing here is calling the CDC transmit FS in this event handler function, passing in the data we received and the length of that data. And that's all we're doing. Then I can compile this little hammer at the top left and then simply click run again. And now we have our firmware running on the microcontroller. We've pushed it via serial wire debug. Go to the device manager. I'd like to open a serial connection on my host computer, the one you're seeing at the moment, via COM7. So for that, I'll use putty, create a serial port, connection COM7 and forward rate by default is 115-200, click open. So now we have that on the host computer. Again, this is my USB connection to the microcontroller. Now I've started my phone with the STBLE toolbox app as before. So I'm gonna to connect to Bluefill as we see here. So I click connect. So side by side, hopefully you're seeing this now, you're seeing Putty and my phone. So we'll go to this custom characteristic we wrote on the right hand side, I'll click on that. I'll click right and let's just send a character. Let's just send an H for example and click send. And you can see in COM7 on our putty, we get that displayed out. Now we've shown that we can get a Bluetooth connection, a USB CDC connection, and the data we're sending over, we can then simply feed forward to our USB connection. I can just type in any other characters and so on. So this is very straightforward. We're only sending one character at a time, but it's just to prove the principle and that the hardware works and how we can create a very, very basic test firmware for our platform. Now, of course, again, this is very basic. You could go back to the, the IOC file, go back to the service, looking at the characteristic and we can change, for example, the value length to higher. We can make the length characteristic variable and so on. It depends on your application. We've reached the end of this video. We did a very basic firmware bring up, testing some of the peripherals of an STM32WB55 microcontroller with Bluetooth, serial wire debug, the boot zero setting, USB-C, as well as verifying the chip antenna, at least for a somewhat short distance. That should hopefully provide a great framework or the basis for you to develop your own designs depending on your particular product you're developing or what idea you have. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, please leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with any new hardware, firmware, DSP, and any other electronics videos. Thanks again, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.